Um, this is session two, and we're going to talk about emerging issues in deterrence and arms control. My name is Bey Zainal. I'm a senior research fellow at Chatham House. Today, I have four speakers with me. Um, they are excellent in, the, in, in, in their remarks that they have shared with me, so I'm, I'm really fortunate to chair this event. I have Jamie Kuang next to me, sitting next to me. She is a PhD uh, candidate at King's College. Next to her, we have uh, Jennifer Edwards. Uh, she's a graduate systems engineer in Lockheed Martin in the United Kingdom. And then we have Medicine Istas, and uh, Medicine is an associate research analyst in Center for Naval Analysis. And then lastly, we have James Johnson. Um, he's a postdoctoral fellow in CNS Monterey. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Jamie to give 10 minutes remarks. And she's going to be talking about climate change and nuclear deterrence. And then we're going to turn to Jennifer. And Jennifer is going to talk about the possibility of nuclear space weapons and, and the deterrence aspect of it. And then we're going to turn to medicine, and medicine will be talking about hypersonic weapons and strategic stability and the, the issue of deterrence. So we're trying to link everything to deterrence in this panel. Hopefully it's going to work. Um, lastly, we have James, and James is going to talk about artificial intelligence and strategic stability. So without further ado, uh, Jamie, please, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the introduction. As mentioned, I will be presenting on the intersection of climate change and the future of nuclear deterrence. So throughout my presentation, I want to argue that if current trends continue, climate change will detrimentally affect nuclear weapon systems, infrastructures, and activities, which in turn will significantly impact deterrence postures. So policymakers and scholars alike must therefore pay attention about this intersection and think critically now in order to mitigate its worst consequences in the future. So a bit of a, uh, an overview of my presentation. I'll first begin by explaining the intersection of national security and climate change, arguing that greater attention must be given to the effects of climate change on nuclear weapons. Then I'll consider some specific examples of ways in which climate change will affect nuclear weapon systems, focusing in particular on early warning systems. And finally, I will conclude with some policy recommendations. So to begin with the state of play. According to the UN's leading body on climate science, global temperatures are set to warm by 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2030 and 2052 if current trends continue at the same rate. Some of the results of this will be rising sea levels, extreme weather patterns, and resource scarcity, just to name some of the most detrimental consequences. So states have started to recognize that climate change will pose a national security threat. The UK Ministry of Defense's Development Concepts and Doctrine Center, for example, releases a strategic trends forecast every year, and the most recent recognized climate change as a conflict driver or a threat multiplier in multiple domains. The US Department of Defense, in particular, has also done some leading work in this area, most recently releasing a climate report in January of this year that assessed the vulnerability of 79 key military installations vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change. But I would argue that the link between climate and nuclear is missing. And this gap is problematic for two primary reasons. First and foremost, uh, many nuclear decisions and planning uh, elements are made decades into the future, with forethought given to changing geopolitical environments and systems designed for service lives of at least 30 years. But current plans fail to consider a changing physical environment. And second, many recent government reports cite this as an era of particular geopolitical and technological uncertainty, requiring a diversity of nuclear capabilities. But I would argue that environmental uncertainty cannot be overlooked, as it will only exacerbate these issues and make nuclear systems that much more vulnerable. So to dive into some specific effects of climate change, I have a series of examples here, and we'll just give a brief overview before jumping into the early warning system example. But up here we have Fort Greeley, Alaska, which is home to the vast majority of US ground-based interceptors and is facing the threat of a constantly thawing permafrost. Uh, then we have the Offutt Air Force Base, which is home to US Strategic Command, uh, which is one of the central nodes of the US command and control system. And it recently faced extreme weather patterns that resulted in extreme, very detrimental flooding. 
And then finally, we have the Marshall Islands, which is the site of significant US testing from the 20th century in the South Pacific. And this right here is the dome that covers 85,000 cubic meters of radioactive waste and is currently being threatened by rising sea levels. But I want to dive specifically into talking about early warning systems. So early warning systems are an integral part of any state's nuclear architecture. They're meant to detect and assess incoming ballistic missiles with enough warning to give the proper authority enough time to launch a retaliatory strike. So they're central to a state's credible deterrent. But they will be affected by climate change. For the US, as I mentioned, the Pentagon report that was re released earlier this year, it identifies Air Force bases with radar-related missions as threatened by recurring flooding, drought, and wildfires, including the headquarters of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. And the radars themselves will be facing coastal erosion, rising sea levels, and melting permafrost for those far enough north, resulting in soil erosion that disrupts the infrastructure of these large radar facilities. And all of this is happening more rapidly and drastically in the Arctic, as demonstrated by the North Warning System, which is pictured here on this map behind me. So the North Warning System is a joint US-Canada radar system made up of installations placed along the state's northernmost borders, as pictured on the map. And it's critical to the deterrent effort of these states and maintaining the security of the state's airspace. But it is currently in need of updates, which is already going to be extremely costly. So the most recent update was uh, in the 1980s. So this technology is now facing more advanced and diverse threats, so needs some modifications. And some have already pointed out the critical importance of updating these systems because of climate change, in the sense that more ice-free months will increase activity in the region and thus require greater monitoring of it. What's missing, though, is how the installations are, that are meant to do the monitoring will themselves cope with climate change. For if they're supposed to be like their predecessors, the updated system should be lasting for 30 to 40 years and require little maintenance and personnel support. But climate change will pose a significant challenge to that, as the system must cope with an actively changing environment. So some of the implications of uh, if climate change is not considered in the design of the updated radar system, it will be less reliable and won't remain operational for as long as previous systems. The biggest climate threat it's facing is melting permafrost. That DOD report explains that thawing permafrost decreases the structural stability to foundations and buildings and the like, and it also requires costly mitigation responses that disrupt planning, operations, and budgets. So the result will be extended resources. Again, the system's already going to cost millions to update, but it will cost even larger sums over its lifetime uh, through significant maintenance and personnel costs because of this thawing permafrost. And ultimately, as a whole, I would argue that that fundamentally undermines deterrence capabilities. As I said, early warning systems are necessary to ensure second strike capabilities. But if you have a radar system that's unreliable or constantly under maintenance, or at least parts of it constantly under maintenance, this undermines the warning system and thus undermines a credible deterrent. And all of this is only exacerbated by the fact that the short-range radars in particular will be tasked with monitoring more and potentially nuclear activity in the region as states devote more and more resources and assets to the Arctic as the strategic space becomes uh, more accessible. And so all of this is only to mention some of the potential direct effects of climate change on nuclear weapons systems. I would argue that there are additional effects that I would be happy to be talk about more in the Q&A, um, but some could potentially include a changing operational environment that could affect geopolitical tensions, um, operations of the nuclear weapon systems, for instance, these radars might need greater sensors, uh, and potentially resource scarcity and competition that could have a strategic impact. And it's also important to recognize, I've talked about this in a very US Western sense, uh, but climate change will be affecting all states' nuclear weapon systems, including both China and Russia. So what can we do about it? Climate change is a reality, so more must be done to think about it in security terms, and as I argue, specifically nuclear terms. So one of the ways we can do for it is commission a dedicated nuclear climate assessment. So something that goes beyond this 29 Pentagon paper report that I've been citing, uh, beyond its short time frame of just looking 20 years into the future, something that looks further and something that looks specifically at nuclear weapons infrastructure, and not only the systems themselves, but deterrence as a whole. 
We could develop plans for mitigating the worst effects of climate change, thinking uh, in advance about them, and this can ultimately serve as a model for other states to do the same. The UK, for instance, could assess the effects of climate change on Faslane. Second, I think we should seriously consider ways in which climate change will affect extended deterrence. So again, in the, NATO, uh, in the Arctic context, how might NATO's extended deterrent be stretched uh, and pressured amidst greater activity and thus a changing operational environment in that strategic space? And in the Asia Pacific, how might the US extended deterrent be stretched amidst greater competition in the South and East China Seas? So finally, I think we should be encouraging serious dialogue on the intersection of deterrence and climate change by scholars and policymakers alike across relevant domains and areas of expertise. Much more research and planning should be done to ensure that we're prepared to mitigate the worst effects of climate change on deterrence, and I hope that this presentation can serve as a useful conversation starter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Jennifer, would you go ahead next? And just, just before that, I would like to say that the discussion here is going to be on the records, but as you know, the comments, the Q&A section is, is going to be off the record. Please go ahead. Um, good morning. I'm here today to present to you our uh, thought experiment, Terence Goes Orbital. Um, this is just having a look at the technical feasibility and possible advantages and disadvantages of different space weapons. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank my colleagues who helped me with this research, um, Jack Bowler, Lewis Lancaster, and Oscar Lydiard. And I'd also like to make it clear that this is just a thought experiment. We are not advocating the use or the research into these weapons. Um, these thoughts are merely our own and do not represent Lockheed Martin's thoughts as a whole. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about what we mean by the term space weapons. For the purpose of this presentation, I mean nuclear space weapons. The current space weapon is an um, intercontinental ballistic missile or submarine launch ballistic missile, which is a fairly well-known capability. In the middle here, we've got the reusable space plane. Currently, this is used for civil purposes, such as the European Space Agency for research. However, it's not unfeasible to imagine in the future this could be used as a weapon. Finally, we've got this orbital weapon, which is an enduring orbital capability. This would be a constellation similar to a constellation of small satellites, which we would predict be, would be placed in low, low Earth orbit and have a duration of about 15 years. It is important to note, however, at this point, that this is banned by treaties, including the Outer Space Treaty. Whereas the reusable space plane falls into this kind of grey area of if something orbits for about a year, is it an orbital weapon or is it just transient for a very, very long time? Um, if we look at now where space begins, we have a look at the Karma Line, which is at about 100 kilometres above Earth. The weapons we're talking about would be found here. So you can see that the ICBM or SLBM would be well into the space boundary, as, low Earth, as well as low Earth orbit, which is found just above the International Space Station. At this point, I'm also going to mention, I pointed out that this satellite would be a constellation of satellites. This means that they would have to obtain a similar global coverage, which is about 42%. You'd need 144 different satellites, which obviously increases the technical complexity as well as the cost. And I'm going to talk you through a bit about the life cycle of these weapons. If we start by looking at the launch of nuclear material, this has been done several times um, throughout, uh, throughout the lifetime of um, space missions. Um, indeed, uh, radioisotope thermal electric generators, or RTGs, are used in deep space missions um, very often, including by the Russian military. Um, these, however, are uh, power-grade material instead of weapons-grade material. Now, weapons-grade material is a lot more toxic and has a much longer half-life, so it would cause more damage if it failed at launch. As you can see, there is a significant percentage of failures in unmanned launches over the last 20 years, meaning you risk damaging your own country if you are launching these weapons. If, however, we assume you've made it into space, you have to survive in quite a harsh environment. Now, whereas ICBMs or SLBMs are only transit through space, so do not have to deal with the issues for as long, any orbital weapon would have to survive up there for a significant amount of time. This includes looking at the thermal considerations. So low Earth orbit has a fluctuating temperature scale of minus 170 degrees centigrade to 123 degrees Celsius, um, and even greater temperatures during re-entry. This means that a complex thermal protection system is needed to protect any weapon up there. Similarly, radiation needs to be shielded against, as high energy ions can affect the electronic system and damage internal components. Um, finally, we want to talk briefly about space debris. So this is extremely poignant at the moment with the recent Indian anti-satellite weapon test, which some suggest could even damage the ISS, despite being found in a different orbit. 
Indeed, the, no the amount of space debris is significantly increasing over the years, especially with collisions and anti-satellite weapons testing. As you can see from the bottom picture, this means that even a small fragment of space debris could significantly damage the system that the weapon is held on. If we now look at the end of life, we have a few options. So either you need to service it and maintain its capability, you need to be able to safely destroy it, or you have to unfortunately use it. If we think, talk, think about maintainability firstly, um, both the space plane and the current systems can be fairly easily returned to their home base and be serviced and then reused. Um, however, the constant orbital capability does not have that luxury, and therefore a different satellite would need to be used as a, a maintenance vehicle. Otherwise, you'd have to deorbit it or allow it to burn up in space when it comes to its end of life. However, if we have to use it, um, this also faces some extra technical challenges. Um, if we look at satellites in general, they have been able to be returned to Earth from low Earth orbit or similar orbits, such as the Soyuz descent module. However, as you can see from the top image of the nose cones, which are going in this direction, um, a pointy nose cone, which would be what you'd have to use for a weapon to maintain speed, has a lot uh, harsher conditions it needs to withstand, and therefore some work would need to be done into the research uh, around this area and looking at this. Um, we did some calculations using internal Lockheed Martin software about the time to impact of these different space weapons. Whereas an ICBM or SLBM is estimated to have a total estimated operational time of 45 to 60 minutes, the uh, orbital weapon, both the space plane or the constant capability, would have a total estimated minimal operational time of less than 20 minutes for a strike. This gives it a significant advantage, which I'll talk about shortly. However, this does come with some caveats. The orbital launch requires a large amount of fuel, which is very costly. Also, a space aim would require launch in advance, so it needs to be up in low Earth orbit before its use. Um, you also have for the permanent orbital weapon solution, um, this has a repeat coverage time of only two hours, meaning if you miss your window, perhaps for a decapitating first strike, you miss the chance to have the surprise advantage. Um, on the board, I've got a quick diagram of what ballistic missile defense systems are believed to look like. Um, the main advantages of some of our, uh, our systems is that you may be able to beat the ballistic missile defense current capabilities. The missile launch would effectively start from the mid-course mid phase, and as mentioned, you'd have a, a much uh, shorter time to impact, meaning there's a compression of the timeline of BMD systems. This makes it harder to discriminate against the warhead and the potential decoys around it. You also can't see the launch, so the early warning systems that have been mentioned would become uh, less of an advantage, and similarly, you have an asymmetric trajectory which might confuse the ballistic missile defence system. Given the amount of um, uh, successful tests done recently, um, this might give the, uh, an opposing state an advantage over a state with a ballistic missile defence system. However, something that current ICBM, ICBMs or SLBMs do not have to consider, which an orbital weapon would have to consider, is anti-satellite weapons. Now, a complex anti-satellite weapon system would not need to be created, and generally it is believed that space debris uh, satellites could be repurposed into anti-satellite weapons in the future. This, uh, this also adds to the fact that orbital weapons could be tracked. So most countries have a quite complex log of what different things are in space. This means you have the potential of disguising your weapon. However, at this point, it would cease to be a deterrent and instead become an additional strike or first strike capability. So I'm going to briefly touch on politics, although please appreciate this is not my area of expertise. Um, so, as I mentioned, the permanent base capability provides an extra strike capability. However, there are some questions as to whether this would be tactical or deterrence. This means that it is likely to be a rogue nation or a country that is perhaps less concerned about deterrence that is likely to have one of these. Similarly, I've mentioned before that it is banned by the Outer Space Treaty. This means that any, uh, any action putting a satellite in space or a space weapon um, with a nuclear warhead would be seen as a very hostile action and could lead to a Cold War tensions rising yet again. However, there is some benefits to this, such as the space plane providing uh, an escalatory response in times of conflict. This means it could be launched in advance as soon as the nation does something that you believe is wrong, and then be effectively there as a constant reminder that you are ready to strike whenever needed. Um, just to conclude, although we believe that space weapons could provide some advantages over SLBM and ICBM technology and could be te uh, technologically feasible within the foreseeable future, with current geopolitical climate and the risk associated with this technology, this significantly outweighs the benefits posed by any orbiting nuclear weapons. 
Um, now, I was planning on ending this presentation with a somewhat upbeat quote from a famous physicist, which I'll still flick to now. Um, however, this slide, slide was finalised before Vladimir Putin gave a speech in Moscow last week about the implications of Trump letting the New START Treaty expire. And I'm just going to read to you a quick quote from that, presentation, uh, from that uh, speech he gave. If we don't keep this fiery dragon under control, if we let it out the bottle, this could lead to global, global catastrophe. There won't be any instruments at all limiting an arms race, for example, the deployment of weapons in space. This means nuclear weapons will be hanging over every one of us all of the time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Thank you. Medicine, let's go with you on the hypersonic side. Okay. Good morning. I'd just like to say a thick, um, quick thank you to the um, RUSI team for all their efforts in organizing this conference and inviting me to join today. Um, and also, I need to make the uh, quick disclaimer that um, I'm here on my own behalf and the views in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views of my organization or our sponsors. So with that. So I wanted to start by giving you essentially my bottom line up front, um, not leave anyone hanging. So if you don't listen to anything else, at least listen to this. <laughs> um, so based on my initial research on hypersonics and their potential impact with, uh, on strategic stability, I believe that there are some existing mechanisms at our fingertips that we already have, um, such as the New START Treaty, that uh, offer a logical and accessible starting point for addressing some of the narratives around uh, hypersonics and their potential negative impact. Um, however, there are some potential options outside of these forums, uh, but they do, they are gonna require some for their study, but this is an initial excursion. So, oh, there we go. Um, I essentially, how I came about this conclusion, I'll try not to spend too long on this slide, uh, but uh, I, I would say that what we're, what we're facing today, as you can tell by a lot of the, the conversations that we're having here, is we're kind of, we're confronting, I think, what I would say is a, a survivability crisis. So long-term technological trends and advancements in uh, both strategic forces as well as conventional offensive and defensive forces are um, making it really more difficult for states to harden their forces against attack, and not just nuclear attack, but also even potentially conventional attack. Um, so consequently, that means that maintaining strategic stability, or really a stable deterrence relationship, where uh, neither side has an incentive to go first, uh, which was already a complicated and tall order, is really becoming even more complicated. And to what extent a lot of these technologies will have an effect is still Un unknown. Uh, and when thinking about all the different, there's a lot of different starting points. So I included this table here um, from a Lawrence Livermore study, and essentially this is a list of uh, technologies that they identified, current and future, that are they believe are militarily significant. And as you can see, there are several of them that could have a direct impact on strategic forces. So taking this really large problem set and thinking about, okay, where do we, where do we begin? <laughs> um, I wanted to come up with something that was traceable and replicable. So I started with hypersonic missiles. Um, for one thing, they are on this list. Um, so they have been analytically vetted. And then also, uh, as mentioned earlier in the keynote last year, um, President Putin did his exhibition of new Russian strategic systems. And on that list was actually two hypersonic capabilities. So in many ways, they're coming back in vogue. So uh, for my particular approach um, in thinking about how we can kind of bu um, buttress strategic stability in this area, uh, I started thinking about, well, what, what kind of arms, how arms control has previously played a role for us in helping maintain strategic stability? Are there areas where we can apply some of these tools, particularly with promoting transparency and predictability, to help with this? And um, with hypersonics in particular, there's been quite a lot written about the risk of hypersonics uh, and what in the risk that they pose, but not as much thought on the potential mitigation strategies. And there's not really a consistency on exactly maybe what the priorities should be. So um, I started by identifying these narratives around hypersonics and um, basically addressing each of them and then figuring, and rather than drilling on one, trying to create a menu of options um, that could be a starting point and a launch pad, if you will. 
So um, I found through my research essentially four different uh, buckets of narratives is what I'd like to say, uh, how I'll refer to them. And um, the first one is what I kind of like to think of as these were the things we were already kind of worried about that have now been made worse. <laughs> um, so I, as I said, we're kind of undergoing, I think, a survivability crisis. It's really been, it's survival, concerns about forced survivability have been around for forever, but in a lot of ways, we're undergoing a renaissance with a lot of these emerging issues. So in hypersonic weapons is one area where this could be the case. They provide a credible standoff strike option that is really difficult to defend against, um, and they have the ability to undermine a lot of hardening techniques like mobility and dispersal um, of your weapon systems. And additionally, they can um, cause some challenges to your missile defenses. And so there, were, there was already some kind of instabilities there. Um, the instabilities are potentially, could potentially grow, wor grow worse as these come online. The second narrative really focuses primarily on command control communications and um, are, are, are also our early warning detection and defenses. Um, so as Jamie mentioned uh, in her presentation, you know, early warning systems play a really important role in state's deterrence efforts and in the second strike capabilities. Um, hypersonics can challenge these early warning senses and tracking because of their speed and maneuverability. And therefore, um, they have the effect of potentially compressing and disrupting a dis a, an opponent's decision-making cycle um, by reducing decision-making time. And um, this could lead to unintended escalation. Another thing is, uh, coming back to space, is that these uh, weapons rely very heavily on space-based guidance systems. So if you find it difficult to defend against these weapons, there is some strategic logic in actually attacking the systems that help guide them there. <laughs> so, but of course, um, a lot of our space-based assets have dual mission sets, and so there's the possibility if you try to target that, you might tar leave an opponent blind or um, affect other military capabilities, which will in turn, again, cause some unintended escalation. And then with the usability narrative within this, um, the, this has really been more of a, a Russian argument, um, is that at the time, especially when the U.S. was fielding these, was starting to field the conventional hypersonics, um, something that came up is the fact that these highly penetrable assets could um, potentially target nuclear systems and their associated infrastructure without crossing the nuclear threshold. And then how do you respond to that? So the issue of proportionality and um, basically displacing the burden of escalation on the opponent who has to receive the strike. And then the third argument focuses more on the nature of the hypersonic itself. So now, uh, as, we, as you might be aware, the U.S. has made it clear that they plan to only field these in a conventional capacity. Russia, on the other hand, has so far come out and said that they have two systems, a glide vehicle and a cruise missile, and they are nuclear in nature, and they're also dual capable, which fits quite nicely with Russia's strategic doctrine um, and giving President Putin essentially the ability to th set the threshold wherever he so likes. Um, and they haven't been as clear about what their strategic intent for these systems is going to be. And then the fourth argument is around actually what is being called destination ambiguity. So maneuverability, you don't know exactly where, you, there's a possibility of like you're not going to exactly figure out where it's headed for, which can essentially um, complicate your, def your defense mechanisms and your response options. Again, potentially compress, disrupt in a decision-making cycle. Um, and so again, we can lead to see more unintended escalation. So those are, so those are my f the four narratives I identified, and I essentially um, went through each one and kind of started to think through, okay, what can what can we maybe do about each of these unique problems, um, and how what what options might be at our fingertips or that we could come up with? And as you can see um, from the slide, I found there's actually a pretty significant amount of overlap between um, some of the ideas and the arguments that they help address. And I'm sorry if you, the text is hard to read, <laughs> um, but there, uh, those have been bolded and colored. Um, so a really kind of a surprising finding to me is how much applicability the New START Treaty actually has here. Um, if we're able to incorporate the new Russian systems as new types or kinds into the New START regime, this could potentially address a lot of these a lot of these narratives. Um, so the, by then this would do so by increasing the transparency around where they're deployed, how many there are, um, providing more information on their technical aspects, so that way you can kind of make some adjustments in your defense and response options. 
Um, another is actually leveraging the Strategic Stability Dialogue Forum. Um, so this is an area where we could try to provide more transparency into the strategic intent behind uh, what what we how Russia and the U.S. continue to plan and moving ahead with using these weapons, how they fit into their overall posture, um, and discussing hypotheticals. You know, under what circumstances would the use of these weapons? Maybe like what kind of response might they offer? It can all be very abstract, but useful conversations to have, um, and overall just help maybe build some predictability. So those are the tools that we have at our fingertips, but I think there's other potential options for available to us too. Um, so you know, one that is uh, maybe a little out there uh, is actually something what um, Aaron Miles wrote a piece in Real Clear Defense on about ballistic missile defense and an adaptive limits framework. Maybe we could take the similar approach with hypersonics. So just like a really simplistic example would be for every 10 nuclear armed um, hypersonics that Russia deploys, the US can deploy 10 uh, missile defense interceptors. And that's a risk Russia will assume if they want to keep this um, technology. Um, or a pledge of non-interference with space-based assets is another one. Um, the standing up of a joint data exchange center. Um, we used to have this. It shared early warning um, information and notifications of ballistic missile and space, space launches. We don't have it anymore. We could stand this back up and loop in maybe the hypersonics. Um, and this is also has the potential to be multilateralized, which I think is an interesting point, um, especially if the US is sincere about engaging with China on these issues. Um, so I, all that to say, even with some of these more like low-hanging fruit um, starting points, I do think there will be challenges. Um, the first is that uh, realistically, self-interest has to be, it's a key determinator. Um, both sides need to be interested in cooperation and determine that coming to the table will serve their interest. Um, unfortunately, competition at, at this point is really in the space is still kind of underway. So I don't think there's really strong incentives in, for either side to give up their chance on um, maybe gaining an advantage until a clear victor emerges. Um, and then the other is that I've included this timeline here just as an illustrative example of how much muscle memory we have when it comes to strategic, to strategic forces and nuclear arms control. We've had decades to iron out the kinks, and that's what's brought us um, to the New START regime, which I would argue is quite good. Um, and But it's taken a lot of time and iteration. This, with hypersonics, if we want to start looping these in, it's we're going to be starting on page one of a 450-page book, essentially. Um, it'll bring an entirely new set of requirements because of their dual capability, their production lines, et cetera. But all that being said, um, I don't think this precludes us from doing our homework um, and figuring out what is it that we might want out of such a system or what we might be willing to trade or give up. Um, now, the initial analysis from this so reveals that overall, the fundamental nature of nuclear deterrence is, is changing, um, and forced survivability is kind of undergoing a crisis and calling into question overall the robustness of nuclear deterrence, and it'll continue to be challenged as a lot of these technologies come online. Um, my, my initial brief excursion reveals we, we've got some options available to us, and we can come up with, we have some more um, that we could potentially pursue. But, um, and they could have high utility, but this definitely needs to be studied further, um, and we do need to acknowledge that they might require potentially greater effort. So with that, I will conclude, and I thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. James, let's uh, talk about the AI bit a bit. I can hear all the uh, stomachs rumbling in anticipation of lunch. I'll try and keep this uh, reasonably uh, concise. Um, thank you. Um, mention about the lunch yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's off the record as well. Uh, thank you for the introduction and to the organisers for this uh, invitation to speak today. Okay, so given the, uh, the obvious hype surrounding all things artificial intelligence, it is quite easy to overstate some of the opportunities and challenges posed by the adoption of um, AI in the uh, military sphere or military context. Um, while AI technology could enable major improvements to many areas of warfare, including the nu nuclear domain itself, um, for the CIB future, developments will be far more prosaic than the common uh, representation or misrepresentation of AI in popular culture. 
Um, super intelligent AI applications that can learn and teach themselves to resist human control, so-called terminator like uh, dystopian scenarios are not really the type of technology policymakers uh, and the general public should be most uh, concerned about. To be sure, several of these um, highly speculative scenarios um, actually overshadow more urgent and plausible issues. Above all, militaries may underestimate or even disregard some of the limitations of uh, current AI technology. Uh, in particular, their brittleness, opacity, unpredictability, bias, and vulnerability, especially to uh, cyber attacks and, and uh, subversion. Thus, racing blindly down this path towards um, autonomy and autonomous weapons could have dire consequences for nuclear stability. While much of the analytical attention has focused on the impact of cyberspace on deterrence and stability, the potential implications of AI for nuclear stability have so far been under-researched. It is important to stress that while many of these risks posed by AI in the military sphere today are not necessarily new. In other words, AI can be perhaps better understood as a manifestation of a, an established trend in emerging technologies, leading states to adopt destabilizing nuclear postures, such as launching warning, rescinding existing non-first use commitments, or even adopting uh, nuclear war fighting postures. My thesis is, is grounded in four central claims or central arguments. Uh, firstly, as a standalone capability, AI has few discernible direct effects on nuclear stability. That is to say, in isolation, AI will unlikely be a strategic game changer. Instead, much like cyberspace, it will more likely mutually reinforce some of the uh, destabilizing effects of existing um, advanced weapon systems, thereby increasing the speed of warfare and compressing the decision-making time frame. Second of all, AI's impact on stability, deterrence, and escalation will likely be determined as much, if not more so, by states' perceptions of AI's functionality more so than what it's actually capable of doing. In addition to the importance of military force postures, capabilities, and doctrine, the effects of AI in a military context will also have a strong cognitive element, thereby increasing the risk of inadvertent or unintentional escalation as a result of misperceptions and misunderstanding. For example, um, even if autonomous drone swarms uh, were not intended to be or even technically capable of a disarming first strike, the perception alone of the feasibility of such an operation would nonetheless be uh, destabilizing. Thirdly, the increasingly competitive and contested nuclear multipolar world order that we've heard quite a bit about today would likely compound the destabilizing effects of AI and in turn increase escalation risk between great military powers, especially in the context of a Sino-American future crisis of conflict. And finally, and related, against this rather inopportune geopolitical backdrop, the perceived benefits of AI-powered weapons, especially AI and autonomy, will likely prove irresistible to states in order to sustain or even capture, in the case of China, the technological upper, side, upper hand over rivals. So my argument here is that the most pressing risk posed to nuclear security in the short term is the premature adoption of unsafe, unverified, unreliable AI technology in the context of nuclear weapons, which could have catastrophic implications. I've sort of jumped ahead now on these, uh, my, on these research themes, but my, the following research themes illustrate more clearly how and why AI applications fused with non-nuclear weapons might cause or exacerbate escalation risks in uh, future warfare. And this ties in very well with Madison's uh, talk on hypersonic weapons. So first of all, today there are many multifaceted possible intersection of AI with a range of advanced conventional counterforce weapons that could compromise nuclear weapons and their support systems. I'm thinking here of cyber capabilities, missile offenses, anti-satellite and hypersonic weapons especially. 
In theory, swarms of AR-powered drones could be used to locate dispersed targets, such as mobile missile launchers or even ballistic missile submarines, as well as to suppress enemy mobile missiles, thereby clearing the path for drone swarms carrying conventional or even nuclear payloads. This uh, commingling problem set is further aggravated by an increasingly political willingness, especially in the United States, Russia, and even China, to use nuclear weapons to respond to conventional attacks against an adversary's nuclear assets. Again, we're thinking here of early warning systems or even nuclear weapons themselves. So in short, conventional weapons enhanced by AI technology may pose one of the greatest risks to nuclear escalation in future warfare. To be sure, the introduction of increasingly capable advanced technology into the nuclear realm, including AI, is already challenging several long-held assumptions about deterrence, arms control, and uh, crisis stability. Theme two. AI introduces um, a unique means to respond at gigahertz speed in the use of military force. In military arenas, where a premium is placed on autonomy and speed, faster reaction times will likely have outsized strategic effects. Now, a key point to emphasize here is that massive increases in the speed of combat could result in machines reacting to situations at a pace that surpasses human comprehension, so much so that commanders on the field may be unable to control, contain, or even terminate situations. Imagine, for example, if the Cuban Missile Crisis was truncated from 13 days to a matter of hours or even minutes. Therefore, until experts unravel some of these unexplainable um, or unknown or so-called black box features of AI, um, human error and machine error will likely compound one another with uncertain and unexpected outcomes. For now, at least, it remains self-evident that human decisions escalate a military situation. However, technology like AI that enables weapons to operate at higher speeds, ranges, and lethality could potentially move a situation more quickly up the escalation rungs to a nuclear level of conflict. AI and autonomy could have both positive and negative implications for nuclear stability. Faster and more reliable AI applications, especially machine learning algorithms, could enable commanders to make more informed decisions during a crisis, improve safety and reliability of nuclear support systems, strengthen cybersecurity, enhance information flow and situational awareness, and reduce the risk of human error caused by fatigue or um, repetitive tasks. Conceptually speaking, autonomous early warning systems would allow planners to identify potential threats faster and more reliably than previously. However, and this is a key point, absent human judgment and supervision, together with these inherent, brittle, and inflexible nature of existing um, iterations of machine learning systems, will likely uh, increase the risks of destabilizing accidents and false alarms. On balance, therefore, uh, the confluence of several trends will likely heavily weigh on the stability and detracting side of the ledger including these um, inherently destabilizing characteristics of AI I've discussed, some of these multiple intersections of AI with nuclear security, the commingling of nuclear and advanced conventional weapons, and this backdrop of the competitive geopolitical order, which will likely entice states or could entice states to prematurely implement AI augmented weapons. And obviously a real game-changing scenario would be a situation where AI enables a nuclear arms state to threaten an adversary's second strike uh, capability. Thankfully, even now, the, this technology is not currently mature enough to represent a credible threat. More immediate threats to stability will more likely come from the manipulation of the information landscape in which some of these political and military decisions about nuclear weapons take place. A good case in point is machine learning so-called deepfakes, which have added a new twist to existing risks of miscalculation, misperception, 
and inadvertent escalation. For instance, in cyberspace, a key risk for escalation is third parties spoofing nuclear-only warning systems or planting disinformation in a manner that fools human operators, causing so-called false positives or false alarms. I will finish here and just leave you uh, to mull over a couple of uh, a future uh, research puzzles that flow from this paper before we head into the uh, Q&A session. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.